Welcome to Authored by Us, a podcast celebrating children's books about characters of color or of different cultural experiences and the authors who bring these diverse works to life. Each week, we invite you to join us as we turn the pages of these bookshelf gems and hear from their creators who understand that stories of diverse experience truly come to life when authored by us. Here's your host, Zenzi Hodge. Greetings and welcome back, listeners. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Authored by Us. We are in the month of March, and in the U.S. Virgin Islands, March is Virgin Islands History Month. For me, growing up on St. Thomas, we didn't have a particular month to celebrate VI history, but it was embedded in all we learned and did. But in 2009, a local governor proclaimed that March would be VI History Month and that this would be a time to reflect and pay tribute to the heritage, legacy, and rich culture that allows all Virgin Islanders on island and abroad to enjoy a deep sense of humility and pride. So today's episode not only features a Virgin Islands author, but one who tells stories set with the VI as a special character. I am so pleased to have I, Carol Husbands, join us on this episode to talk with us about her book, How Red Ants Got Their Color. Welcome to the show, Imani. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, I know I introduced her as I, Carol, but I know her as Imani. So we have some familiarity. And so you'll hear me call her Imani during the show. And I I just love it when we're joined by guests who I have a personal connection with, because then we're able to share additional stories. Yeah. At the start of the season, we interviewed author Lisa Martin Suber about her book, There's a Bee in My Book Bag. And she implored readers to consider things from the perspective of the bee, which is a little odd. But I've been bitten by red ants, and let's just say I felt no compassion for the ant and what happened to him after. So tell us about your book, How Red Ants Got Their Color. Well, I wrote it, I want to say 20 years ago, easily. Um, It was during Hurricane Marilyn, and the schools were all closed. And we had kids just going half sessions. Um, so I had most of the neighborhood kids on my porch on most afternoons. And I sat there um, and my kids kept telling me, I have two children, David and Chantal. They're tired of reading books about other kids, blonde hair, speckled kids, nothing about them. So I started writing things about them. And it comes from, or spawns from our picnic we had at Santa Maria Beach. Um, we're at San Maria Beach, which was owned by the Bashota family, having a picnic. Of course, we're down there having a good time, and red ants invaded our picnic. End of story. I got bit, had to go to the emergency room, which is not in the book, but um, that's where it stems from. It talks about their travels from being mostly having this picnic, the things that we ate, and how it transpired. So I felt so much nostalgia when I read your book and then hearing you talk about it, Santa Aww. Maria Beach and the Bashalta family. So it, it really takes me back to growing up on St. Thomas, mm-hmm. you know, particularly when you talked about places like Bordeaux and walking up the hill. And I instantly saw Bordeaux Hill and how tall it is and what it must be like walking either up or back down that hill. Yes, and I also reminisced about my grandmother's. So when you wrote about the grandmother and how she motioned to the birds to keep them from eating the mangoes, Mm -hmm. and I could see my grandmother (laughs) motioning to some birds or to to some pest to get them away from her sugar apple tree. This book to me was like island life just coming to life with your Oh, thank you for saying that. I hope somebody reads this and actually can sit there and go, I remember when I was a kid, this happened because sometimes now you don't see too much of that anymore because with technology and all of the influx from the U.S. mainland, some things that are quaint are no longer existing. So I'm hoping. You're right. There's um, 
there's a piece that we, we, we tend to miss when we get immersed in technology. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we may lose out on the face-to-face -face contact that sometimes we have or the stories that are, that are often told. And storytelling is a big part of our African history, our Virgin Islands history. So, so telling stories to people as you did after the hurricane, telling stories to these children is definitely a part of, of what we do and what we celebrate. How did you decide to go about starting to read this story to children that came to your house when they were out of school because of the hurricanes? Um, they had a, how do you say, a blockade in Mavoni. The main street had water running down it. You couldn't cross the street. They had national guards there to keep you out of there. So we had children running up and down our street, driving everybody crazy. So since I was home from UBI, I had them on my porch and said, let's, let's do something. You know, give me a word. Give me something. We'll make a story out of it. We started out doing that. And I said, well, I got a story for you. And I gave them the story about the whole Red Ants. And as I talked to them, they were my audience to, that didn't happen. That couldn't happen. Try this. Try that. We were doing that because they didn't understand why we had Red Ants. Because we had brown ants in your house because they eat sugar off the counter. We got the brown ants. How do they turn red? So I'm going to tell you how they turn red. So I told him, you take a little hot sauce and put it on the ants, it's going to turn red. No, it doesn't. So I did it. Of course, it's cruel. Don't try it at home. We had the ants rhythming in the hot sauce, but it actually does turn them red for a whole second. So then they believe me. We're like, okay, we got something here. So I went from that to incorporating our picnic and our long treks going around, just seeing the island. Because I had my kids go from Gordo to the opposite Cabrita Point to learn where they live, to know the island. Most kids don't even leave far as their home backyard. So amongst our travels, we incorporated different stops and picnics here or water stop there. So that's how we got into the Red Ants, quite honestly. You know, you talked about a tour and, and taking them on a tour of the island. So you're, you're absolutely correct. Because while St. Thomas is 32 square miles, you know, it's but 13 miles from end to end, there's a lot that you can see. There's a oh, lot yeah. that you can experience. And in your book, you gave a tour of St. Thomas from West End, down in Bordeaux, all the way to downtown and back again. Mm -hmm. you, you covered everything. And so I found myself reading and thinking about driving in the car. And oh yeah, that's right. I would pass UVI or I would drive past uh -huh. uh, the airport. And you mentioned the 99 steps. So there was so much education uh, that you that you gave in this book. And it just shows that there's so much education that can be done with books in general by highlighting right. places, their people and the culture. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that not only those who are from the Caribbean as a whole will probably find something from their hometown in Grenada or St. Kitts in this book as well, but somebody who is from the U.S. mainland to read this book and want to go and visit and go find these 99 steps. And there's also a part in there talked about a flamboyant tree with fingers that reach out that they want to look for that tree because there is a humongous tree unlike any other in St. Thomas. It's only in that one spot you got to go find it. So I'm hoping they're going to climb the 104 steps that 99 steps really is and stuff like that. that. I'm hoping they do that. You know, and that's a really great invitation for people to come and visit the territory. I know we are still dealing with a pandemic, but we, we see visitors coming to St. Thomas pretty often. And there's always a, a walking tour uh, and right. there is a tour up the, the 99 steps. But for people that are visiting uh, or for people that live here, knowing that there is a book that includes a historic site uh, right. and it can give you some of the the sites and images and the buildings that you are walking past now that they've been woven into your story yes hopefully they, they pick up on that and hopefully um children in the virgin islands can pick up a book and see themselves and see their neighborhood in it and embrace it that's what i really want out of this whole thing and that is so important because you said it we read books and we read about every place else mm -hmm. except where we're from. And we want to see ourselves in the pages. We want to see our home on the pages. And you and I spoke about that uh, as I was preparing to launch my book, I was explaining to my illustrator about what a Franco is right. or what sweetbread is. 
And so in your book, you do, there are two things that you, that you do. You not only talk about um, specific places and you incorporate pictures, but I'm also going to talk to you a little bit later about the, the food that you introduced in the book as well. So let's just start with your, your illustrations, which aren't really illustrations. They're, they're photographs cool. and they're not just photographs. There are photographs of actual places and actual people on St. Thomas. Correct, correct. I am a photographer, as most people know, um, since I was like 13, 14 years old. Wherever I go, the camera in my hand. So over the years, I've taken pictures of the Virgin Islands, um, other Caribbean islands, my home in Jamaica, other places, and I keep them. And in looking for an illustrator, I went through people that I didn't know who half of them were, like their pictures, and then they gave me their prices. And I said, you know, I have pictures of all of this stuff. I'll use my own pictures. Um, that's what I did. I used my own pictures. So yes, I got on my on the ground and took a picture of some ants eating crumbs. Yes, I did all of that to put in this book. And um, only you can capture your home where you want other folks to see it. So I had to go stand on Government Hill and take a picture of Government Hill, wait till the sun went down and get a picture of the sunset through the flamboyant trees. So I wanted them to see what I see, basically. And seeing it through your eyes and through your images really allowed the beauty of St. Thomas to, to shine. I hope so. Yeah. I really you know, something else you, you did, you know, I really love how you made our food accessible in your writing. You know, you talked about very specific items that are available on the island and you gave a crucial explanation of sweet potatoes and yams. And I remember having this discussion with my mother. Because she kept saying something about getting a yam. I was like, that's a sweet potato. She mm -hmm. was like, it's a yam. I was like, no, it's a sweet potato. And so you explained it for someone who needs to understand that it's the same item. We just may call it differently here. But it, it helped to build a connection and kind of give some context to the differences and still the similarities with island living and living elsewhere. And you also added a very special treat to the end of your book. Yes, that sure. I know I want to try. You haven't tried it so, yet? No. So tell so tell us about tell us about why you talked about the food, why the food was so important, because I know they were farmers, but also why you added that extra piece at the end of the book. Because food is life. I don't care what you do, where you go, or how old you get, you can always think of that great meal you had with so and so. Or you went to this great restaurant and they served me this. And when I was a kid, like you said before, I used to have a Fraco. Now, I went to New York. I had a snow cone. It's not the same thing. I've been to Puerto Rico. I had a dulce. It's not the same thing. A Fraco is a Fraco. End of discussion. Now, growing up, we had apple yams. It's an African yam. And we used to make things out of that. I'm from Jamaica, uh, in case anybody didn't know, I'm from Jamaica, but I lived in the Virgin Islands a lot of my life. Um, we had Afu Yam cakes. When I read this book to the kids in different schools, the Antilles School and um, Dover, I went to EBO and read the kids this book. I used to bring the muffins to every single classroom. Come back next week. I think they wanted the muffins more than they wanted me to read it, but okay. But um I wanted to make so the whole book talk about how her favorite thing was these muffins. So you can hear about it, but you taste this muffin. Then you're saying, and you're not read this book, them muffins were so good. And you remember, so tasting that muffin is like tasting part of your childhood for my kids. Because they always had these muffins as kids. I make them every now and then, now at Thanksgiving. But just to have that food, it reminds you of that nostalgic time when everything was so sweet and simple. I wanted somebody else to taste what I used to taste when I was a kid. So I put it in the back of the book to make them on their own. And when I, when I saw the cover, you know, I said, oh, this is going to be a book, like a folktale, a book about how the red ants got their color. But it wasn't. It ended up being a story about a girl and her dad on an adventure into town. Yep. And the, the things they saw, the meal they shared, the day they spent. And then going back home. Mm -hmm. And yes, we learned about the ants, but it was really more about a story about a dad and his daughter. And yes, that's me. I really like that. That's good. I have a daddy's girl. So 
I couldn't not write a book about her and her dad because as much as I can do things with but daddy did this with me and daddy does it best. And so many guys get a bad rap for being dads who aren't the kind of dad your mom wants them to be, but he's the kind of dad that he can be. And that's what he did with her, little excursions with her. So I thought it'd be nice tribute to him. The book doesn't say to him, it's to all the kids who I read this story to on my front porch. So in the byline in the beginning, all the kids I read to are in the front of the book that say, this is for you. Um, but I hope people also get that, that dads can also have that relationship with their daughters if they're allowed to have the kind that they have, not the kind that you want them to have. Yeah. Now, I know you kind of, you spoil it in the beginning, <laughs> but not necessarily. You you said you told the children how the ants got their colors and you said, you know, it was because of the hot sauce. Right. But I wanted to find out, did they turn red because of the hot sauce or because they were mad that you threw the hot sauce on them? So were they mad out of what was done or because of how they felt about what was done? That can be a good discussion for a classroom. <laughs> it really can. So if I tell you the real reason that I thought, it was spoiled for a classroom. Because... Um, we tried this, the example with the kids experiment and they, they turned red because of the hot sauce. They didn't live long, but they did turn red. Um, but when I wrote it, it was because the hot sauce made them turn red. But I like that mad thing. I do like that. <laughs> and to our listeners, I am not going to encourage you to put hot sauce on any ants. That full disclaimer. We are not saying I like throw that. hot sauce on ants at all. <laughs> because I like that, that could actually not it not it's it's not gonna work out well for the ants. However, it will not work out well for you either. Right. Never get bit <laughs> by a red ant. And I have. I have my I have red ants fall all over my feet to prove it. But yeah. For that same picnic. <laughs> yeah, they got me. Oh, yeah. We're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back with Imani Carol Husbands. Like what you hear so far? Make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. Authored by Us is made possible by listeners like you. We thank you for your support. Now back to the show. We're back with Imani Carol Husbands. So Imani, I need to know if this is, you know, an old folks tale. In your book, you wrote that creases bring ants. Is that true? My grandmother is from Mandeville, Jamaica. And she would tell you, if you have creases in your bed, if the blanket's not folded, it is folded over, it's not flat, you're going to have ants in your bed. I have had ants in my bed, not because I had the creases, but because I had peanut butter crackers in the bed under the pillow. So I couldn't say if it's true or not, but that's my grandmother saying if it was, if it had creases, it brings ants. And that was your grandmother making sure that you made a proper bed. A proper bed. Proper. I <laughs> <laughs> now, I also noticed that there was something very detailed about the blanket that you described in the story. Okay. You said that there was an ivy and then there were some colors that you used to describe the hibiscus. Is there any special reason that you focused on the blanket that much? Why, yes, my darling. Um, I crossed... Uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated in the Virgin Islands. And somebody sent me that blanket as a gift. So I thought to honor her, I put it in my book. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> you know, as a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, I always let people know that great things come from great people and these great people tend to be members of the organizations that you and I share in common. Go ahead, tell it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask if the story was based on something personal, but it seems like it's based on a, a combination of different things. Mm -hmm. So tell us about what was your inspiration behind the story um, and is it does it resemble specific experiences in your life or just a culmination of experiences that got you to this particular point of writing this book? Um, it was a combination of several things. Um, writing it because my children wanted to see themselves in a book outside of Peggy Sue with the, the freckles. The fact that I finally put it on paper 
I told myself I'm going to publish this book several times and, and it never worked out. I went to Elin Harrison's workshop to help get published and he chose somebody else. And I'm like, it's never going to happen until my son and his fiance were going to have a baby. I'm going to have a grandchild soon. I'm thinking it's been 30 years. Put this thing to paper some kind of way. So I finally got it published. I didn't care about the money. I just wanted to get it published to say that I did. But everything in that book took place either in the Virgin Islands from my childhood memories of Jamaica, but most of it took place in the Virgin Islands. Those things actually happened. Nothing in there is untrue except for the blanket, which was not my grandmother's. It was actually from Asora, whose grandmother gave it to her. So it's not a total lie. It's just not my grandmother. But the blanket, I still have it. I don't even use it. It's in the plastic. I don't want to get fall apart or get dirty. I figured if my daughter ever cries, I'd give it to her. But um, it's, it's a habit. But everything there is authentic. Um, the, the, the actual picnic took place at the beach, and it the ants did attack us. The ride itself, we took and taken on several occasions for the family going to Bordeaux. I have family in Bordeaux, friends down there. Went to enough of those barbecues they had with the um, barbecue society. Texas Barbecue Society in St. Thomas had enough barbecues I went to down there. So um, I just love St. Thomas because it saved my life on a few occasions. So um, I just love the island. So I hope people read it and fall in love with it as well. You know, and if you had any question, because Imani has covered places <laughs> and people and now organizations on St. Thomas. This is this is truly St. Thomas is truly important to you and it's home. And you shared with us that you're not originally from St. Thomas, but it's without hesitation that you call St. Thomas your home. Mm -hmm. You know, what has it been about your experiences in the Virgin Islands that have uh, given you this sense of connection and now this calling to pay tribute to the VI in your work? I went to St. Thomas at a time, I was just, just out of college, um, dating a young man and would meet his parents, you know, meet the parents met the parents, and I fell in love with the island. When I got there, Eddie and the Movements was the thing. <laughs> and Eddie and the Movement, my neighbor was Nick Friday. And around the corner, yeah, around the corner was Steve Terrell and um, Chesterfield, right around the corner from me. So whenever they had a rehearsal, they come around the corner, a little red bug, pick me up, we would go out to Quayla's house in Smith Bay, and we would go to practice. I met these guys to this day. Jennifer Friday, Nick's older sister, lives around the corner from me here in Atlanta. I see her every other day. So we still keep in contact. But I had the experience of the whole summer with, with what well, action. That was my summer in St. Thomas. And it was like, this cannot stop. I was back down a year later and I just stayed. So I, I lived all, all the glory days in the our musical club hopping here and there. You can go from one club to the next. You can go to Red Hook and go hang out, leave there. And, I mean... It was just, it saved my life to me. And I spent a lot of my good years of my life on St. Thomas. So I always called it home. Even when I leave and go back, I still call it home. How can you not love coming down Rapoon Hill? How can you not co love coming down Rapoon Hill? And first thing you see is that view. How can you not love that? You had the worst day in your life. You're like, ah, that view just makes it all better. Honestly, for me. So in addition to putting a link to your book in the podcast notes, I'm going to have to put links to the VI Department of Tourism because, uh, oh. uh, yeah, we've given a whole plug. And then also to Nick Friday, we need to hashtag Nick Friday, rest in peace Friday, and to Eddie and the Movements, because I'm sure that there's either someone that needs to know about Eddie and the Movements or somebody that wants to hear their music. Well, those who don't know, Jam Band. Is Eddie in the movement? It used to be Eddie and the Schoolboys, then it became Eddie in the movements, and it became the awesome jam band to this day. So it's all the same movement, but just those who can't see me, I have on my VI Tourism Ambassador shirt. So in my capacity of VI Tourism Ambassador, I'm giving you golden places to go. <laughs> you are absolutely representing the VI. Da -da -da. And in, in the work that you're writing and in the things that you are sharing right now, you are absolutely representing the VI. So we're going to take a quick break, but before we do, mm -hmm. I'm going to let you give us your come and visit us in the Virgin Islands. Nice promo for the VI Department of Tourism. You're sitting home, you're stuck after COVID. They lifted the travel ban. 
And what do you want to do? You want to head to St. Thomas. Why? Because VI nice, so nice, so nice. That's why. <laughs> we will be right back with Imani Husbands. We'll be right back. You're listening to Authored by Us. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review so you never miss an episode. Now back to the show with your host, Zenzi Hodge. So we're back with Imani Husbands. So Imani, I know that this is not your first book. It took you some time before you you brought the book out, but it's part of a series of books you've done, but it's not the first book in the series. Correct. So tell us about the other books that you have available. Okay, the first book I wrote was called The Rooster and His Crown. It takes place in St. John, and it talks about um, a young man who, who raises roosters and sells them at the agricultural fair in St. Croix every year, and his journey to have the best roosters in the Caribbean. The second one was Red Ants, and the last one is Granny Says. You know how your little kid and mommy says, no, but Granny Says... Um, so it's about Granny Says. It takes place in Barbados, where is my daughter's grandmother is from. Um, I have four more that are in the hopper, but I'm trying to release them every six months because I would have put them all up there one time. But um, And they take place different islands where I traveled to or lived. And tell us where we can find your books. They are on Amazon.com. What I'm not sure of is how you search for them. Um you can do Caribbean folk tales. You can put in I period Carol husband. They'll pop right up. And listeners, as always, we will have links to Imani's books in our podcast notes. And we also have our authored by us bookshelf, which holds all of the books for the authors we feature on the podcast. So you can go directly to authoredbyus.com forward slash bookshelf and find links to Imani's books there. Yay. Now, I know you took some time before you published this work, but what's important in your story is that you persevered even though your publishing was delayed. What advice do you have for writers, whether they are new to the process or have felt that their path to publishing has been winding and long? Oh, the main thing is do not give up. It's a cliche you hear all the time, but seriously, do not give up. I thought the only path to publishing was to go to McGraw Hill or some big publishing house. And I tried all of that submission, the 85,000 copies and the says the Sazy self-addressed stamp envelope, that whole route. But now in the year 2021, you can do self-publishing. You can go to Amazon. You can go to a number of places to publish it for you for little to nothing or nothing. But my biggest thing was just to be published. I didn't care about the money. If your thing is you want to get residuals, then I would say pick a powerhouse to have it done. But please do not give up because there's an audience for you. There is. That is absolutely true. There, There is an audience for you. Um, and it just takes sometimes a little bit of determination or words of mm-hmm. inspiration from someone like you who has taken the time and, and worked at it over some years, but did not give up and you persevered to make sure that you made this book available for for readers, whether it's young children or for adults. Um, And that's what's important to continue on. Thank you. Our inspiration comes from different places. So what has been the greatest influence on you as a writer and the greatest influence on your writing? The biggest influence for me was my grandmother, Juanita Francis Thomas Leo. She was my inspiration. What, what I did, how bad I messed it up. She always told me, oh, no, 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 no. We can fix that. It was always do it, do it, do it. I don't care how long it takes you, just do it. I don't care what I did wrong. She always had my back. Always. More so than my mom did because she was Nana. And when she passed away, it, it would change my whole entire life. Nothing made sense anymore. I became a grandmother, and then I understood what she did. The other influence in my life is my kids. I say are, bad English, are my children. 
just watching them sometimes brings me to tears. My daughter right now is um, fighting a autoimmune disease that they have no cure for. So it's hard sometimes watching my child cross her room and she's fighting just to cross the room because her muscles are deteriorating. So when I see her, it brings me to tears and say, I got to spend as much time as I can with her, do as much things as I can with her and immortalize her in a book or so because when she's gone, she will live on somewhere else. So that's probably it. Thank you. You're welcome. So in How Red Ants Got Their Color, you start by reading the story to a group of children. And I know as kids, we all enjoyed having books read to us. So what was the book that had the most impact on you when you were a child? There was a book called Make Way for Ducklings. Um, the book takes place in Boston, um, on the Boston Commons. And in my childhood, I lived in Boston. And my grandmother every year would take me to the swamp boats every spring to ride those swamp boats. I know it was dumb, but the little ducks come out of the boat. You feed them your Cracker Jacks. It was a thing every spring for us. So that book meant everything to me. And I have a copy in the house of my kids. Um, that was my biggest thing. For my kids, it was little engine that could. I still have a copy of up my son when he was two. And he knew the, the book by heart. By the page so we thought he could read he memorized the book so yeah <laughs> that was mine imani i have to thank you for being here with us today this has been a wonderful discussion not just about your book but reminiscing about things about saint thomas uh growing up here as a child and, and enjoying it so much more as an adult so thank you for spending the time here with us today on this episode of authored by us oh thanks for having me and hopefully when i put something else out there that fits into your niche you call me back absolutely because we want to hear more about your books because we only talked about how red ants got their color but you also mentioned granny says and how the rooster got his crown. So we want to, we definitely want to make sure that we hear about those as well. All right. Well, thank you. Well, listeners, as we close the cover on this bookshelf gem, I'd like to thank this week's author, Imani Carol Husbands, for being here with us to share her book, How Red Ants Got Their Color. And remember that Imani's book and all of the books we feature on Authored by Us can be found on our exclusive Authored by Us bookshelf. The bookshelf is located online on our website at www.authoredbyus.com forward slash bookshelf. This week's episode would not be possible without you, our wonderful listening audience. Thank you for joining us this week, and we invite you to return every week as we talk with a new author sharing their book. Until next time, happy reading. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Authored by Us. Every author has a story to tell, and we enjoy bringing their stories to you each week. Whether you are listening as a young reader or are sharing this podcast with the young readers in your life, we are delighted to celebrate these stories inspired by diversity and shared in the voice of their authors. Follow us on social media at Authored by Us and subscribe to our podcast using your favorite podcast app. That way you never miss an episode. Have a gem on your bookshelf that we should have on ours? Visit us online at authoredbyus.com and let us know. Until next time, happy reading.